All right, good morning, everybody. How is everybody? All right, my name's Roy. Uh, Pastor Mason asked me to come and continue preaching through the series Faith That Works. So we've been going through the book of James, chapter by chapter, kind of verse by verse. And so he asked me to preach out of James chapter 2. And a lot of people believe that James chapter 2, 14 through 26 is like the key passage in the book of James. So um, I, I believe so too. So we're just going to go ahead, read the passage, get right into the message this morning. So if you'll stand with me in honor of the word of God, we're going to read James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. The Bible says this, what good is it? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one. Good, even the demons believe and shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works. And by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messenger, messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Let's pray. Father, there is so much potential in this room this morning. I pray, Father, that I would not um, get in the way, that I would preach with love and grace. And I pray that your spirit would come, that it would do a work here this morning in this room. And I ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be seated. So um, there's some pretty heavy stuff in this passage, okay? There's a lot of theological debate um, for centuries. There's been, you know, debate about whether or not, you know, works or faith, works versus faith. And this morning, I don't want to get caught up in the weeds of all the works versus faith debate. Instead, what I want to do is focus on the heart of what James is trying to say in this passage, right? What he's saying is faith without works is dead. And if you're a Christian that has faith, but you don't have works, it's useless. It's not good to anybody, right? So what I want to do is look at the heart of that, because I think if anybody really understood the heart of Jesus' message, it was James, okay? Because James was the half-brother of Jesus. He was Jesus' oldest half-brother, so he lived with him his whole life as a teenager, listening to everything that he had to say. He listened to his ministry when he was an adult, but James didn't become a believer until after the resurrection. But in this passage, I think he's trying to tell us what Jesus was trying to say through his entire life and ministry. And so what I want to do is perform an autopsy on a dead Christian. Because when somebody dies and you want to find out how did they die, what happened to them, that's what you do. You perform an autopsy on them, right? Um, and I know that we do not have any dead Christians in our church. So I had to go to another local church and ask them if I could borrow one of their Christians. Um, and they're like, yeah, this guy's not doing anything anyway. You can take him for the week. Um, just try to make sure you bring him back better than what you found him. So that's what I'm going to do this morning is perform an autopsy on a dead Christian. Now, when a medical examiner performs an autopsy on someone, one of the first things that they do is look at the person's brain because there's a lot you can tell about how somebody lived or how somebody died by looking at their brain. For example, um, I was a traffic homicide investigator when I was a police officer. And one of the ways that you can tell if somebody died at impact or whether they laid there for several hours after the car crash um, until they died is by looking at the brain. If you take the brain out and it's swollen, they probably lived for several hours because they were alive but dying. If it's normal size, then they died on impact, right? So one of the things we're going to do is kind of look at this guy's brain and figure out what happened to his spirituality here. <clears throat> so, 
It's kind of big. Wasn't expecting this. Um, I think that I know what happened, though, when I see something like this. And what happened, and what we have a tendency to do, one of the reasons why we don't go and do works and we just kind of sit and don't do anything is because we start filling our mind with a bunch of logical reasons why we can't serve, right? We come up with all these excuses, why we can't get involved, why we don't have the time to do something, all right? Um, And I'm the same way, like I'm absolutely guilty. Can I be unspiritual here in church for a few minutes? Is that okay? Um, So a couple weeks ago, about a month and a half ago, I was at the back of the auditorium during the worship service and I happened to stand a little too close to the VBS table where Miss Lucy was and Miss Lucy's like oh hey Roy are you going to be volunteering for VBS this year and I was like oh Miss Lucy you know I'm so sorry Uh, I'm working Monday through Friday 8 to 5 like I'm not going to be able to help with VBS like perfect excuse I'm out don't have to worry about it and let me clarify that um, I love children kind of They, like, I love high-fiving kids, I love interacting with them in short stints, but anything that involves children where they're, like, yelling and screaming and singing, like, that's not my jam. That's not what I like to do. Have you guys seen How the Grinch Stole Christmas? And at the beginning of the movie, he's standing at the top of the mountain, and all the Whovilles down in Whoville beneath come out, they surround the tree, and they're all singing really loud, and he's standing up there, like, nervously drumming his fingers on the rock, right? And that's me during VBS, like, I must find some way to keep VBS from coming. Like, that's the way that I am, right? So I'm like, oh, man, Miss Lucy, you know, she's got me. And she knew something I didn't know, and that was that VBS was from 6 p.m. to 8.30 when we originally planned it. And so she's like, oh, well, that's perfect um, because it's going to be from 6 to 8.30. I'm like, oh, crap, know what I do now? And uh, she goes, and, you know, your children are going to be there. Don't you want to spend time with your children? I'm like, Miss Lucy, you greatly overestimate how much time I want to spend with my children. I don't, I don't like them that much. And uh, so she's like, well, your wife's really pretty. Don't you want to spend some time with your wife? And I was like, I really don't like her that much either, Miss Lucy. So she laughed. I laughed. I tried to walk away. Miss Lucy's like, oh, hey, you're doing missions this year, and you're going to be great. And just like that, like, I was roped in to doing VBS. And I can't tell you how much I was dreading doing VBS, okay? Because I didn't want to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, go to work, get off at 5, get home, jump in the car, drive out here, be here from 6 to 8.30, get off there at 8.30. By the time you clean up and get everybody out, now it's 9 o'clock, right? Get home 30 minutes later, it's 9.30. Get the kids in bed, it's 10 o'clock. And... I have to do this for an entire week? Not to mention I've got hundreds of pages of school stuff to read, 15-page report due that week. I did not want to serve in VBS. I had plenty of logical reasons to do it, right? We all can find logical reasons not to do stuff, but the point is if I didn't do it or if somebody else didn't do it, who is, right? If we're not the salt of the earth, who's going to be the salt of the earth, right? We, we have a tendency to, to find reasons why we can't do stuff. And one of those reasons why that I've seen in my experience is hurt. We use hurt a lot as a good reason why we shouldn't get involved in something, right? Um, how many of you have been to a restaurant or a store and had an experience with somebody that, you know, they're not having their best day. They're kind of rude. And, and you decide, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're just having a bad day. Anybody had that experience? Like most of us, right? So how many of us have went to another store or restaurant and had a bad experience? And, you know, we are just like, everybody in this place is unprofessional. They're rude. I'm never coming back to this place ever again, right? We all do that too. And that's a psychological principle called generalization. We take an experience with one person or one thing, and we project it upon the whole of everybody. Now, don't raise your hands for this one, but how many of us have experienced generalization in church and projected a bad experience with a church, a pastor, another church member, a life group, a serve team, and projected that upon everybody else? And we allow it to affect how involved we're willing to be in a ministry. There's a a story in John chapter 5. 
And in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, there was a pool uh, and around a place called Bethsaida or Bethesda. And there was a legend that surrounded this pool that an angel would come down and it would touch the waters and the waters would ripple. And if somebody came and got in the waters and they were the first person after the waters rippled, they would be healed of any of their sickness, any of their pain. So naturally, there would be lots of people surrounding this pool waiting for the water to be rippled. And on this day, like every other day, there was a 38-year-old man who was laying beside the pool. And Jesus is walking by, and he sees this guy, and he realizes that he's been there for a long time. And the guy had some issues with his legs, and he couldn't walk. And so Jesus comes up to him, and he says, hey, do you want to be made well? And the guy starts listing off all these excuses and reasons why he can't. He's like, look, man, my legs don't work. And I'm not a nice guy, so I don't have a lot of friends. And so there's nobody to, like, pick me up and carry me to the pool when that's happening. So I've got to try to crawl all the way over to the pool. And while I'm crawling, somebody else that has good legs comes down, and they get in the pool, and they get healed before I do. So I'm just going to sit here like I do all the time. Right? And Jesus ignores what he's saying pretty much and says, okay, well, hey, how about this? How about you just get up, pick up your mat, and walk? And because he's Jesus and he heals people with his words, the guy is healed. He gets up, he picks up his mat, and he walks. I'm like, great, awesome. And nobody would have noticed this guy on any other day, except this happened to be a Sabbath day. So it's a day of rest and relaxation. And so as he walks by a group of pious religious people, they're like, wait a second, what are you doing? You're not practicing good self-care. You're not resting. And he's like, hey, it's not my fault. Like, don't blame me. You know, the guy who healed me, he said, pick up your mat and walk. So that's what I'm doing. And like all, you know, good religious people, they get indignant. Well, we want to see who this guy is that's telling you to break all these rules that we have. So who is this guy? And he's like, well, I don't know. He kind of just slipped back into the crowd right after he healed me. And so uh, later he goes back to the temple area. And the Bible tells us in in John chapter 5, verse 14, It says that there was another experience that he had with Jesus. It says, after this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. Jesus seeks this guy out again. He says, look, I healed you physically, but now I want to heal you spiritually as well. I I fixed one problem. Now I want to fix another problem. So what does this guy do to... You know, does he, oh, yes, teach me all this stuff, and thank you so much for what you did to me. Well, John 5.15 says he did something else. It says the man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, or because of this, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Have you ever invested uh, time, money, effort, into a person or a ministry only to be hurt by them, hurt by the pastor, hurt by the church, hurt by somebody that you helped, right? And then we use that as an excuse to go into self-preservation mode and not help anybody else because we've been hurt, right? I can't tell you how many times getting involved in ministry that I've had somebody tell me, hey, be careful how close you get to somebody. Don't invest too much. And there might be some wisdom in that, but when I look at the scripture and I look at Jesus' example, that's not the example that Jesus had, right? Because Jesus knows when he heals this guy that eventually he's going to go dime him out. And his persecution is going to start because he heals this man. But not only did he heal him knowing he's eventually going to turn on him, but Jesus sought him out a second time. Jesus didn't allow the hurt that this guy was going to cause in his life affect the way that he ministered to him or the way he ministered to everybody else after him, right? So I think that one of the things that we have to remember when we're dealing with this is that the easiest way to be dead but alive is to start filling our mind with all these reasons why we can't do something. Because when you're feeding your mind something, that's what's going to happen. You're just going to continue to feed your mind. I want you to remember, if you, don't, if you walk away from this sermon and you don't remember anything else, remember the spiritual principle. What you feed grows, and what you starve dies. What you feed will grow, and what you starve will die. So, you know, if we want to look at what happened to the brain, we have to go and, and look at some other things. Um, and one of those things that we have to look at is the eyes. 
Because there's a lot that doctors can tell about somebody by their eyes, whether they have high levels of stress, whether they have diabetes, cancer. Um, you ever seen an EMT shine a light in somebody's eyes? What they're doing is they're checking for the pupils, right? Because the brain controls pupil function. But spiritually, it works a little bit different. If you want to figure out what happened to the brain, you look at the eyes, because the eyes actually control what ends up happening in the brain. So we're going to look and see what happened with this guy's eyes. Yeah, tickling him. He's dead. So, all right, here we go. Now, I'm not a doctor, but this is probably an issue, right? But I think um, spiritually I know what's going on, but if we want to figure out what happened spiritually to this guy and what caused that in his brain and this with his eyes, we have to go back a little bit in the book of James. So uh, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, <coughs> sorry, says this. It says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom, or the gospel, and preserves in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer. This person will be blessed in what he does. You see, this guy was always looking at himself, right? Because it's easy to convince ourselves why we shouldn't go get involved in something if we're focused on ourselves, right? Because if we're not focused out on other people and what's going on and we're focused out and on ourselves, we can give ourselves all kinds of reasons why we can't do something. So how do we become a James 2 type of dead Christian? It's because we have James 1 type of eyes, right? And that doesn't mean you're a bad person, right? Uh, plenty of good people have that problem where we focus on ourselves. Even the greatest men of the Bible had the same issue where they would focus on themselves. So in J uh, John chapter 4, we have a story that Jesus, he's coming back from Jerusalem and he's tired and he's coming through an area called Samaria and he stops by a well near a small town. And he stops at this well and he's tired so he sits down and his disciples thinking like, hey, we're going to be good disciples, so we're going to go into the town, and since he's tired, we're going to go get him food, and we're going to bring it back for him. So they leave, and on their way down the road, they pass a, a, a woman who's coming to the well. And she's coming in the middle of the day when nobody else is going to be there because she's got a lot of shame. She doesn't want to be other, around other people in the town, right? Um, she's got a reputation. And when she gets to the well, she finds Jesus, and she's kind of disheartened because she doesn't like being around men. Men are really only interested in one thing. She's been divorced five times. She's kind of just made her way around the town. But when she finds Jesus, she finds a different kind of guy. And he wants to talk to her. And he starts telling her about this living water. And they have this great conversation. And through the process of this conversation, she realizes, like, this guy's there's something different about him. Maybe he's a prophet. Maybe I should turn this conversation to more religious talk. And as she does that, she's like, hey, where should we worship? And she's like, worship in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or in Samaria or wherever you're at. And she goes, well, you know, I know that someday the Messiah is coming. And he's going to tell us all things. And in one of the sweetest moments of all of Scripture, Jesus leans over to this woman. And he says, hey, that Messiah that you're looking for, that's me. I'm that guy. And the reason that's so sweet is because this woman, this lonely woman on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, she is the first person in all of Scripture that Jesus tells he's the Messiah to. It's not Peter or John or any of his other disciples. It's not Nicodemus in John chapter 3. It's this woman who's been divorced five times. And she gets excited and she runs down the road. And as she's running down the road, the disciples are coming back up with all the food. And they get to Jesus, and they all sit down, and they start eating. And uh, they look over, and Jesus has kind of got this, like, weird smile on his face. And he's, like, looking down at the town. And they're like, he's not eating anything. What's wrong with this guy? He's like, Rabbi, eat, eat something. And Jesus tells them, he goes, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? And Jesus said this, he goes, my food is to, to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your 
eyes and look at the fields because they are ready to harvest. Like Jesus didn't want to eat, Jesus wanted to work. The disciples, they were focused on food and Jesus was focused on people. They were focused on wanting to fill their bellies and Jesus was focused on wanting to fill the kingdom. They were looking at themselves and Jesus was looking out at the gospel, right? And it's easy to lose focus and it's easy to get stuck looking at ourselves and so much so that we can't see anybody else. And it's easy to forget that there is a whole other world out there that we can't see. So I'm going to share another unspiritual story from my own life here. And uh, in January, I lost my job. And I wasn't too stressed out about it at first. Me and Angela, we've been really good with our money. So I had six, eight months I could go without having a job. So I wasn't worried. And I've seen God do some really incredible things in my life. So I think, okay, he's got this. I'm not going to stress out about it. So the first month goes by and I get some job offers, but nothing that really pays the bills the way that I'm going to need to get it paid. And uh, I start praying about it, and I feel like God's just telling me, hey, be patient. You can trust me. So I'm like, okay, God, yeah, I, I trust you. And uh, second month goes by, and nothing's really happening. I pray about it, and I feel like God's saying, hey, be patient. You can trust me. And uh, as I'm praying, this one little passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 7 keeps coming back to my mind. And it says this. It says, who among you... If his son asks him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you, right? So I'm like, hey, all right, God, let's get this bread. Like, come on, you're going to, I know you're going to provide. Like, this is going to be awesome, right? And uh, so another month goes by, and I get a job offer. But the job offer pays about $10,000 less than what my previous job paid which is a lot of zeros when you're not making that many zeros to begin with. So, but I'm like, hey, you know what? We'll figure it out. We'll dip into savings. I'll find some way to make it work. I take the job. So I get to job first day, and uh, they had told me in the interview that they covered 80% of health insurance cost. Well, when I get to my orientation and they give me the benefits package, I find out that they only cover 80% for the employee. They do not cover anything for the family. So they want my health insurance to be $1,200 a month in addition to making $10,000 less than what I was making before, right? It, and that was my reaction. Like, I was not happy about it. So you would not have wanted to have been on my back porch that afternoon when I got home and was talking to God about what I felt like he was doing in my life. Like I was not singing you're a good, good father, okay? I can tell you that. It was like David in the Psalms, right? Like wake up, God. What are you doing? Like, do you not have any idea what you're doing? Like, you say that you will give us bread because you're not going to give us a stone, right? I want to give my children stones. And God, this doesn't taste like bread. This tastes an awful lot like stones. And I was angry. And uh, I spent several weeks thinking about one thing. This one thought just kept running through my mind. What do you do when the words on the page of your Bible don't match up to the reality that you see in your life, Right? And uh, so I struggled with this for a couple weeks, and then one morning I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm, I'm thinking about this. And uh, God had to wait till I was brushing my teeth because it was the only time I'd shut up long enough because I was so <laughs> mad about it. And so I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm thinking about this, and uh, like, what do I do when the words on the page of my Bible don't match up to the reality in my life? And God said, "Well, you're looking at the wrong thing." And I was like, "What?" And you see, this year I changed the way that I read the Bible. So I've always, uh, you know, done the whole, like, read through the Bible in a year thing, three, four chapters a day, get through the whole thing. And this year I decided I was going to do something a little different. I was going to pick the book of John, and I was going to read through the whole book throughout the year and just type up everything that God was showing me as I was reading through the book. And one of the things that I've noticed, and I think I'm in John chapter 8 or something like that for the year, is that in almost every situation, at least this far into the book of John, there are always people looking at one thing, and Jesus is focused on another thing. They're looking at, like, the physical world and what's going on there, and Jesus is looking at the spiritual world and what's going on there. And God's like, hey, stupid. Like, I've been trying to prepare you for this all year long. Like, if you, if the words on the page of your Bible aren't matching up to the reality that's in your life, it's because you're focused on the wrong thing. And, you know... 
the fastest way to become spiritually dead is to begin focusing on all the wrong things. The hearer and not the doer, he's focused on himself. But the doer, he focuses on the gospel and he preserves it, right? But if you really want to figure out what's going on with somebody in their spiritual life, you really have to look at their heart. Because in Proverbs, you know, it says that you need to guard your heart because out of your heart come all the issues of life. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it tells us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, right? So the heart comes first. So we really have to look at what was going on uh, with the heart. Good guy. So <clears throat> this is what happens when uh, we start looking at ourselves and we start feeding our minds all these logical reasons why we can't go out and work and do stuff for the Lord. We start hardening our hearts. Um, we become like Pharaoh in the story, right? Where you see all the need around you and you see all those things going on, but you don't let it affect you and you let it harden your heart. And I can't tell you how many times in my life I've had to stop and think like, am I hardening my heart and not allowing myself to be affected by all the need that I see around me? Because when we do that, what we become is just apathetic. And I think personally that one of the most destructive forces in the entire world is an apathetic Christian. How many times has an apathetic Christian been an atomic bomb that has been set off in somebody else's life? Right? Somebody is going through a terrible time and in one moment they just need somebody to care about them and to love them and, and to invest in them just a little bit. And they come across a Christian who is careless in that moment. And what does James chapter 2 say about that type of Christian? What, what good is it? What good is it if we're that type of Christian? And any time I hear that question, what good is it, my mind is brought back to another story in John chapter 11 about a guy named Lazarus. And Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Lazarus gets sick. And so his sisters get worried about him, and they send a messenger to Jesus. They say, hey, Lazarus is sick. We need you to come. We need you to heal him. And so by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus is dead. And there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. There's people crying. And Jesus has this conversation with Martha in John chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. He says this. He says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Like, she's like, I believe. I got, I got faith. So they leave that place and they go down to the tomb. And it says that, verse 38 says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead four days. Like, Lord, he, like, he's dead. Like, not like a little dead, like he's dead dead, like he stinks. Like, what good is it going to do if I move the stone? Like, what, what good is it? Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. And then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you will always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And we all know the story, right? Lazarus comes out with the clothes draping off of him. And like, praise God, Jesus raises the dead, right? Like, that's a great story. But did you notice how that happened? Like, let, let's go back. Jesus told them to move the stone, right? And Martha's like, what, what good's that going to do? And she's like, look, I told you something. Move the stone. And it says, so they removed the stone. You got to understand that Jesus did not move the stone. They moved the stone, right? So Jesus can absolutely bring people back from the dead. But somebody has to be willing to move the stone. So Martha believed, I have faith, Lord, you can resurrect somebody. But it wouldn't have done Lazarus any good 
if somebody wouldn't have been willing to move the stone from in front of the tomb. And we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be stone movers? Because what good is your belief to anybody else if you're not willing to do anything with it? In James chapter 2, he's saying that the things that you do matter. Your faith has to be active with your works. There's another story real quick right before this. Jesus is in Jerusalem and the Jews come in and they say, hey, look, stop messing around. Don't keep us in suspense anymore. If you're the Messiah, just tell us you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, hey, man, I have been telling you with my works. And they pick up stones to stone him. And, and Jesus says this, look, he says, John chapter 10, if I am not doing my father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. How do we know that the Holy Spirit is in someone? Through their works. How do we know that somebody is abiding with Christ and walking with God? It's through their works. Jesus said, look, if you don't believe what I'm saying, believe what I'm doing. And I want you to know that people aren't going to believe your words. They're going to believe your works. They're going to believe what you do with your faith. And so what do I mean by works, right? Um, for one person, that may be getting up and preaching a sermon. And for somebody else, that may be playing on the worship team or helping at Kid Check or in the nursery. It may be uh, making quilts or flowers, right? But it doesn't always have to be at the church, right? Helping out with VBS. It could be doing something like mowing somebody's grass or helping somebody pay for groceries in the line in front of you when they don't have the money. Or just being nice to somebody or praying for them if they're having a bad day, right? There are times where Jesus healed the blind. And there are times where he raised people from the dead. But there's also times where he just recognized a small guy that was up in a tree. And there are times where maybe just remembering somebody's name can be a work that speaks volumes to them about who Jesus is. So let me ask you this. Do you have anything on your to-do list for Jesus this week? Like, are you going to do some sort of project that's going to point somebody else to Christ? Are you going to do something that's going to trumpet his name? You know, are you going to be willing to move a stone this week in somebody else's life? Because the temptation is to come to church and to sit here and hear a message and leave and not be changed by it. The temptation in our lives is to allow the chairs that we sit in in church to become spiritual coffins. And this morning, I think Jesus is calling out to all of us to come out and be a stone mover. And while I was preparing this message, I had to ask myself a lot. Like, am I more like the guy on this table or more like the Jesus in my Bible? Am I more likely to be making excuses or to be moving stones? Am I more likely to be looking at myself or be looking out at the gospel and all the other people that need, uh, you know, just, because guys, if I, am, if I am this guy, what good is it? Because ultimately the goal at the end of our lives is not to hear well thought or well said but it's to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, I encourage you to come forward. We've got people here that can help you know how he can bring you back from the dead. Or maybe you do and you just need to recommit to being a stone mover. I ask you this morning that if you need any of that, come forward at the invitation and somebody will be willing to meet with you and pray. Phil must have been really into the sermon because he didn't, uh, he was not ready. You dropped the ball, Phil. It's kind of awkward. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Lord God, we want to be alive in Christ. Lord Jesus, we want our faith to be alive. Lord, we ask that that's only possible through your spirit. And so, Father God, as you have allowed your word and through the example of Jesus and how he came alongside of people's lives and moved them from being uh, that which was not dead 
to be alive. That, Lord, this morning that we would listen to your spirit knocking on the door of our heart. Lord, we don't want stone hearts. Lord God, we want to be alive. And so, Lord God, as we have this opportunity now to take those next steps of faith, whether that is to move from where we are at and to do something about it, to actually take that step and move to our next steps table and say, I need Jesus. I need to take that next step of faith. I want to be a part of a church family that loves Jesus and that is loving others so that they aren't dead but become alive. Lord, however way that you've been knocking on the door of our heart this morning, whether that's even to come forward and just pray here at the front and say, God, allow my to-do list to be something that brings a smile to your face and brings others to Christ. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and sing as God has moved. Let's take that next step of faith together. So I don't know about y'all, but I'm really impressed that he's been here the entire time. So um, just so you know, this is just not a, you know, a mannequin. Michael, can you close some prayer? Because the, the aspect that, that he really has been here the whole time, and uh, that's impressive. He hasn't been sleeping. He's been here, and uh, actually, we're, we're in a... In a in a physical sense, we're going to have someone rise from the dead. How's that? So, there we go. Come on, man. That takes some pretty amazing.